Greetings and welcome back to the course. We're in the home stretch. I, from here on, am just going to give a few philosophical vignettes. If you look at the YouTube channel for Physical Biology of the Cell, or alternatively go to my website for the 2021 edition of the course, you'll see that I, I had a number of different uh, sort of short vignettes aimed at highlighting themes approaches, philosophies, philosophy, uh, philosophies of knowledge, philosophies of biology, philosophies of physics, philosophies of the role of mathematics in our reasoning about the world, on having a sense of wonder, you know, on and on and on. And I think that I'm not able to understand science in the absence of those sorts of philosophical sides. That's not to say that anybody else has to share that. I'm just saying that for me, those things are really important. And so in this vignette, what I'm planning on doing is talking about why physics needs biology and why biology needs physics and why I need them both. And maybe I'll start with that last point, which is it's a uh, when one looks out at the world, so where are we today? Today is March 14th, 2022. It's a day in which three people that I know in the last week have tested positive, positive for SARS-CoV-2, the Omicron variant. And we have polemics raging around the world about whether or not people, whether masks work, whether people should wear masks, whether vaccines are dangerous, whether people should be vaccinated. And regardless of all of those points, I think it's fair for me to say to all of you that it's as unequivocally true that there are things called viruses as it is that the earth is roughly a spherical object. You know, it's not a controversial point. I think it's also not a controversial point that there are infectious agents that get human, human beings sick. Um, and then I will say it's March 14th, 2022. That means that there is a war raging in Europe and it, it has to do with the Russians and Ukrainians and you know, I, I can't comment on the enormous forces at play, but why I need them both, okay? I'm trying to address that point. And that is that, you know, from a young age, I've been interested in trying to understand this very mysterious life that I have and that you have and that we all have. This mysterious and beautiful world, this mysterious and at times shockingly ugly world, trying to understand and make sense of what I see with my eyes, what I hear with my ears, what I touch and so on. And what I would say is that though imperfect, Science has been one of the greatest tools of knowledge generation in the history of the human species. And so I need them because they give me pleasure. They give me insight. They help me a little bit understand this mysterious life. So what we're going to do, so that, with that as my background, I want to talk about why physics needs biology and why biology needs physics. Here you see uh, a really cool thing that had to do with Galileo figuring out something about why the cross-section of legs had to be, had to scale in the way that it does, which if I remember correctly is like a fourth power. And, um, and this is funny because he originally set out for these kinds of problems because he was trying to figure out whether the mechanics of Dante's Inferno made sense, you know, literally. Could such a place exist? has to do with scaling and you know if you scale up an object will it still behave as it did when it was smaller and the answer to that is no and so he wasn't really satisfied with his treatment of the problem of Dante's Inferno but it did later lead him to think about the the size and shapes of animal legs anyway okay so here we go so there's an article that was written by David Merman uh, about 20 years ago ish and this was an article that arose in response to the 100th anniversary of the great year that Albert Einstein had. Three of the four huge papers from Einstein are shown on the right. The top one has to do with really 
Brownian motion, but I think that that is to trivialize it. It really has to do with stochastic thermodynamics. It has to do with trying to understand out of equilibrium and so on. The middle one has to do with the introduction of the photon concept, and the bottom one is special relativity. So this was a great year, and 100 years on, people tried to think about the advance of physics over that last 100 years. And one of the ways of formulating the question was, if we were to wait another hundred years, what would I want to know? And Merman, David Merman, who's a physics professor at Cornell, is, a, I would say, a very deep thinker. And he found that most people's answers to these kinds of questions were too provincial. They were too short term. And he, he tried, he tried, given the limits of our imagination, first to call attention, to cause us to realize that so many of the ideas of the 20th century, the words for them didn't even exist in 1905. Superconductivity, wave function, boson, fermion, hadron, transistor, Zener effect. You know, I can just go on and on and on and on like this. And it really leaves me with a horrible sense of humble humility because it just makes me realize how hard it is to anticipate what will be the next big thing. And I think, you know, even in the year 2000, already we're only in 2022, and in the year 2000, I doubt that anybody saw the CRISPR revolution coming, just to name an example. So, you know, CRISPR uh, is, is sort of a, a thing. So, so what did Merman do? He, he pondered this question and one of the ones that I liked was he said, you know, tell me a device in 2105 that's as we, that will be as weird to me as the laptop is to Einstein, but upon which, you know, I'm doing this recording. I think that's a, a good way to, to think about it. What does that have to do with this? Why, why does physics need biology? Why does biology need physics? And so on. I'm, I'm on the why does physics need biology part right now. And the reason I'm showing this Merman thing is that for me, I think I've already said this in this term or last time I taught the course or whatever, I'll say it every chance I get because I don't have to change my mind about it. What I'd like to know in 2105 is, have we developed some more general ideas for thinking about non-equilibrium? So let's talk about expanding the horizons of physics. So Fourier, wrote this article, uh, sorry, this book called Analytic Theory of Heat. This is, you can see at the bottom is 1822. In the upper right of the right-hand side, you will see if you look closely that this is the, the green function for the heat equation. And at the bottom of that page, the, the product of three terms is the three-dimensional version of the green function for the heat equation or the diffusion equation. And the thing I want to say is that Fourier knew exactly what he was up to. And so I'm going to actually read you quite a bit of this. Uh, this is from the first four pages. I'm going to read you a lot of it because I think it's important to note that despite the huge success of Newtonian physics, there were phenomena that fell that did not fall within the purview of that mecha said mechanics. And Fourier knew that heat was such a phenomenon. And my point today is that biology offers us this category of phenomena that are going to stretch us in the same way that even the phenomenon of heat stretched us beyond the Newtonian revolution, the mechanical worldview, so to speak. Primary causes are unknown to us, but are subject to simple and constant laws, which may be discovered by observation, the study of them being the object of natural philosophy. Heat, like gravity, penetrates every substance of the universe. Its rays occupy all parts of space. The object of our work is to set forth the mathematical laws which this element obeys. The theory of heat will hereafter form one of the most important branches of general physics. And, you know, I could say the object of our work is to set forth the mathematical laws which this element, that in this case the element would be the living phenomenon, obeys. The theory of living matter will hereafter form one of the most important branches of general physics. The knowledge of rational mechanics, which the most ancient nations have had been able to acquire, has not come down to us in the history of this science. If we accept the first theorems in harmony, is not traced up beyond the discoveries of Archimedes. This great geometer explained the mathematical principles of the equilibrium of solids and fluids. About 18 centuries elapsed before Galileo, the originator, originator of dynamical theories, discovered the law of motion of heavy bodies. 
Within this new science, Newton comprised the whole system of the universe. The successor of these philosophers have extended these theories and given them an admirable perfection. They have taught us that the most diverse phenomena are subject to a small number of fundamental laws which are reproduced in all the acts of nature. It is recognized that the same principles regulate all the movements of the stars, their form, the inequalities of their courses, the equilibrium and the oscillations of the seas, the harmonic vibrations of the air and sonorous bodies, the transmission of light, capillary action, the undulations of fluids, and find the most complex effects of all the natural forces, and thus has the thought of Newton been confirmed. But whatever may be the range of mechanical theories, they do not apply to the effects of heat. These make up a special order of phenomena which cannot be explained by the principles of motion and equilibrium. We have for a long time been in possession of ingenious instruments adapted to measure many of these effects. Valuable observations have been collected, but in this manner partial results only have become known and not the mathematical demonstration of the laws which include them all. Um, so, you know, he, he wants to basically do for heat what Newton had done for mechanics. And, uh, what you know, this, this page, I won't read it out loud, but he... He points out, you know, it sounds like a modern statement about the, the, the great questions of climate science. You know, I think it's really cool. You have a picture, you can read it. Uh, okay, I, I just want to finish. I've deduced the, these laws from prolonged study and attentive comparison of the facts known up to this time. All these facts I have observed afresh in the course of several years with the most exact instruments that have hitherto been used. To found the theory, it was in the first place necessary to distinguish and define with precision the elementary properties which determine the action of heat. I then perceived that all the phenomena which depend on this action resolve themselves into a very small number of general and simple facts, whereby every physical problem of this kind is brought back to an investigation of mathematical analysis. From these general facts, I have concluded that to determine numerically the most varied movements of heat, it is sufficient to submit these substances to three fundamental observations. So, you know, he... Uh, yeah, he, he formulated for himself that task. And I'm just trying to say, I think living matter is, you know, a great example of that. Here I show you the early development of, um, I think this is a uh, frog. Um, and the reason I'm showing it is that I'm asking the question, you know, why, why physics needs biology it's because biology presents us with phenomena that fall w outside of the purview of the physics until now. And I ask, how can physics exclude this as this kind of thing as a phenomenon? You know, to me, that's just totally unacceptable. The reason being that physics is a study of the natural world. The natural world involves the collision of a sperm with an egg and the subsequent temporal and spatial process that unfolds, which, you know, here you're about to see one of these eggs break open and uh, a tadpole swim away. These are atoms from the periodic table. Nothing more, ultimately. Atoms from the periodic table, table come together and swim away. So, you know, I, I said, what do I want to know in 2105? I want to know what is the status, if you like, of the most general version of thermodynamics. The subject started very strong. So Sadi Carnot had these, this insight that by abstraction, he could take the complicated design of a steam engine shown on the upper left and capture it all in what's shown at the lower right of the, the left side, hand side figure, which is the, the famed Carnot cycle. People like Clausius had started to articulate ideas about a mechanical underpinning to the phenomenon of heat, you know, a little bit of a generalization and going beyond what Fourier had to say. And this came to its perfection, I would say, in the form of the work of Josiah Willard Gibbs, who mathematicized the, in a variational way the terminal, how to arrive at understanding the terminal privileged states of systems whether it's uh, ice or water or a magnet or the, even the, as I said in a recent vignette, the interior of a star, the, this thermostatics helps us understand, no, it does better than helps. It, it formulates a principle, a mathematical principle that these terminal privilege states must obey.
So that's a great success. But then what happened is that as far as the dynamics that goes with thermodynamics, it really didn't, quote unquote, realize its potential. One of the wonderful things that happened is that we learned about these laws that relate flux to degree of disequilibrium, which here I label as the driving force. There are linear transport laws that relate these things. Awesome. We use them a ton in this course, but it's not enough. And, you know, what I, I guess the way I, I might want to say this is to channel the words of Stan Ulam, and I, and I think I already mentioned this in another vignette. So he said, you know, using a term like nonlinear science is like referring to the bulk of zoology as a study of non-elephant animals. And Tandor, who's a, a master of the subject of active matter, said, you know, non, saying non-equilibrium physics is like saying non-elephant biology. I love that. I think he's right. And, you know, in a way, we're living right now in a revolution. You know, what it will look like in another 50 years, how the textbooks will, re will be rewritten, I don't know that, and I don't think anybody does. But what I can see is nibbling at the edges of exactly the kinds of questions that in the 1850s people were attacking in the formulation of thermodynamics. So Schrodinger, in his What is Life, I think beautifully articulated that every time we attack new phenomena, we should not be surprised that those new phenomena give rise to what you know is colloquially and distastefully for me referred to as new physics. So here, here he says, there's just one general conclusion to be obtained from it, and that, I confess, was my only motive for writing this book. It emerges that living matter, while not eluding the laws of physics as established up to date, is likely to involve other laws of physics hitherto unknown, which, however, once they have been revealed, will form just as integral a part of this science as the former. How beautiful is that? He's just saying, and I can't see why we would want to disagree with him. Let's review the history of physics century by century since 1687, which is when Newton published his Principia. The 1700s were the crowning achievement of mechanics, culminating perhaps in the, the great analytic mechanique de, um, of Joseph Louis Lagrange. You know, that is a testament to what could be achieved with mechanics. Now let's think about the 1800s. The 1800s saw the emergence of Fourier and the laws of thermodynamics, but also Maxwell and that treatise. So new kinds of phenomena, the heat phenomena, that led to a unified view of heat. New phenomena, electricity, magnetism, and light led to the unified theory of that in the form of Maxwell. Then the microscopic world opens up and that gives us in the 20th century quantum mechanics, quantum field theory, you know, the most successful theory some say ever that gives you 10 digits of accuracy, theory experiment comparison. It is, despite not being my favorite part of physics, it's hard to turn your back on that kind of success. We also had in the 20th century a reformulation of how to think about gravity, where the fabric of space-time and the notion of geodesics tells us about the motions of heavenly bodies. So Schrodinger's saying, people, let, when we open our hearts, when we open our eyes, when we open our measuring apparatus to thinking about the life phenomenon, we're going to do this again. And that's this century. We're doing it. This is now. So Schrodinger um, was one of many to pose this question of, you know, what is the nature of life? And I, I think that it's important for us to all realize, and there's a recent book by Carl Zimmer that I so strongly recommend to everybody to read because he gives a history of our confusion with what is life. And here I give you a number of examples that he, he taught me about um, that I think are really excellent about this confusion. So cytoplasmic streaming, I talked about that a little in this course. People like Cordy, they noted that there appears to be perpetual motion, you know, the motion of chloroplasts and giant algae and stuff like that. The middle one I definitely talked about, and that has to do with Tremblay and his insights into Hydra and regeneration, you know, more confusion about the nature of life. The upper right has to do with Volta and, and uh, Gal Galvani going back and forth about animal electricity, the fact that you could kill a frog and then animate its legs. Down at the lower left, this is an example where somebody digs up some tissue from 30,000 year old um, permafrost and can regenerate entire fertile plants. And then the bottom right is Huxley's confusion about something that was found on the Great Challenger expedition. I, have to, I don't have time to go into it here, but this is all just to say that 
it's so easy to think that we're the ones who got it. And I just feel confident that a hundred years hence, people look back upon us and, and look upon us in the same way that we look upon Lamarck, or that even if I'm being honest, that you could look upon, I, I mean, I shudder to do this because I'm talking about one of my greatest, greatest, greatest heroes, Maxwell. But originally, you know, he imagined little vortices wandering around in space having to do with electricity and magnetism. They had the ether, you know, that stuff's gone. So that has to do with confusion, that has to do with the limits of our imagination, and we are confused about life. So Schrodinger's big question, which I think is going to lead to new physics, is this question of, um, of how can the events in space and time, which take place within the spatial boundary of a living organism, be accounted for by physics and chemistry? So I, though I've said it before, I want to comment on what he might have meant by this notion of accounting for, because that is why physics needs biology, because we need to account for biology in a way that we recognize as physics, and in so doing, we will enlarge and expand and make physics more beautiful. So accounting, as exemplified in the work of Schrodinger himself, we can think about the spectral lines. So this is a 100-year journey in the... Uh, in the, um, in the 1800s, uh, there's this really fantastic article um, that, you know, I, I don't know if this can even be seen, but it's called The Composition of Stars. It's one of the best, uh, best treatments for me that I've ever seen of spectrometry and spectroscopy. And the, the spectral classification of spectral lines and what that had to do with how to think about stars but the point is, is that there were these spectral lines. Balmer wrote down an empirical formula. I recommend that all of you, as an exercise, right now, seriously, use that formula. P and N are integers. Lambda is the wavelengths. I should give you the wavelengths here so you have them. Figure out what the Rydberg constant is, numerically. In other words, just figure out what that constant R is. It's a number with some units. Figure it out. It's got units of 1 over length. So do that, and then you will appreciate more, I think, much more the achievements of Bohr, first of all, and then Schrodinger and others later, in which they obtain that constant R in terms of the fundamental constants of nature, such as Planck's constant. You know, it was, it was a great achievement. I'm leaning over because I want to read what Planck had to say. If the question concerning the nature of white light may thus be regarded as being solved, the answer to a closely related but no less important question, the question concerning the nature of light of the spectral lines, seems to belong among those difficult and complicated problems which have ever been posed in optics or electrodynamics. And, you know, what I, I'm trying to say is that in 1926, when Schrodinger wrote down his wave equation, and he was able to obtain the Balmer formula, and then one goes farther, you know, like once we get a little bit more sophisticated, and P, this was done in like five years, people just nailed this stuff. You could figure out the Zeeman effect and the Stark effect and, you know, all these things by doing perturbation theory and so on, you know, that, that is accounting. And so, you know, I want to say that at the time, there, were, there was a lot of factual knowledge. There were factual knowledge about spectral lines as illustrated in this 1939 book, MIT, Wavelength Tables with Intensities in Arc, Spark, or Discharge to More Than 100,000 Spectral Lines. And this reminds me very much of the state of the art in terms of pathways, genetic pathways, signaling pathways, and so on. We have a lot of factual knowledge. But now we at least know what the conceptual framework is for understanding those spectral lines. There's basically one idea or one set of ideas or one set of principles, depending on how you want to talk about this, that, that we know are the basis of explaining those spectral lines. It does not mean that I can calculate from first principles each and every one of those 100,000 lines. It does mean that we have a framework that we think would, in principle, explain them. So when Schrodinger talked about new laws, we can think for the moment about laws with the lowercase l in the hope that in the longer term there will be laws with a capital L. And I just said, you know, that the original phys physics list of relationship between, um, between flux and driving force or degree of disequilibrium, that's a very powerful example of some laws. On the right, I'm showing you the ways in which the chemical master equation can be a a tool of unity that can help us understand disparate biological phenomena. And I would also say that the same is true for graph theory. Jeremy Gunawardena has been really pushing these ideas of graph theory. 
and I think in a very, very powerful and interesting way. Uh, and what I mean by that is that apparently disparate phenomena, when written in the language of graph theory, we will then actually see them as, in some sense, the same. So, so that, that's, um, that's what I wanted to say about why physics needs biology. I hope it was slightly coherent. The notion was that every time we expand our vision to broaden the set of phenomena that we demand a quantitative understanding of that we would recognize as physics, we learn new physics, to use that ugly expression. So why does biology need, need physics? You know, this was in some sense articulated by Darwin, who said in, a, in his autobiography written for his kids, he says, in after years, I've deeply regretted that I did not proceed far enough to at least to understand something of the great leading principles of mathematics. Those thus endowed seem to have an extra sense. And so it's that extra sense. I love genetics. I love its ab abstraction. I talked about this earlier in the term. I love the fact that Sturdivant and Thomas Hunt Morgan knew the position, relative positions of genes on the chromosome without ever knowing even that DNA was a genetic material. That's awesome. I love biochemistry. I think it's amazing that somebody like Dan Fletcher, you know, can take actin and polymerize it underneath a cantilever with a microscope and watch it grow into the cantilever and then measure the force extension properties. Or Julie Terrio and others can take act A and coat beads and they can see the spontaneous motion of these beads in much the same way that Listeria moves around. I love that. I love molecular biology and the fact that we can use PCR. I love bioinformatics, you know, to be perfectly honest. This is not a partisan thing of saying the only way to approach these problems is by a physical biology. No. I don't buy, I don't buy that for a millisecond. It's just saying, you know, why would we not want to expand our palate and, and use all the tools at our disposal? Plus, you know, personal taste. Yep. It's true. My favorite way to understand things is through the prism of mathematics. That's true. And that's how I want it. That's the demands that I want to place on the future of biology. So one of my big hangups, one of the great displeasures of being part of the field of biology, and you know, at some point people still, may, maybe, you know, I, I think uh, I, I like the joke, what is a biophysicist? Somebody who tells, talks about physics to biologists to biology, about biology to physicists and about the weather to other biophysicists. I accept my shallowness. I accept that I am not that good at physics, not that good at biology. So maybe the joke is really <laughs> meant to be aimed at me. But, you know, I think I've taught freshman biology, I don't know, 12 times. I've written a few books on biology or something. At some point, saying, oh, well, you're just a physicist kind of loses its allure as, uh, as an insult to belittle my particular take on how to think about the life sciences. So. Here it is. I personally am irritated by the thought that factual knowledge is somehow the goal here. Uh, I think that conceptual knowledge is where it's at. That's my particular taste. That's, my, that's why I went into science. I'm not saying that you should agree with that. Part of the beauty of life, actually, is, is to talk to people and see that they, their life's journey led them to a different take. I'm just telling you mine. I wanted to have a sense of order. I wanted to have a sense of sameness of things. So for me, conceptual knowledge is what it's all about. You know, new data is only interesting to me usually insofar as that it might teach me something about concepts. So here, I'm just, I'm not gonna go into the details of this. You know, if you're interested in it, send me a mail. But you know, I consider this to be profound. The fact that there's a few points here. I could change the labels on these axes and put physics labels like current and voltage or something and nobody would know. The comparison between theory and experiment is so rock solid in this case, and this is parameter free to boot, so this is not some fit, um, then it's, uh, it's really, really amazing that we can have a conceptual knowledge of gene expression. You know, it's little steps for little feet. But here, you know, we're really uh, to the point where we can control some knobs. You know, it's especially the one in the upper middle that's, uh, that's amazing to me. The fact that we could, this is a, these are log log plots with internal structure on them. You know, when you have structure on a log log plot, it usually means something interesting is, is going on. And so at any rate, we, that, that's conceptual knowledge. And I'm claiming that tons and tons of people that I've encountered in biology now are working on conceptual knowledge. And I think that's amazing and fantastic. 
Another, another uh, reason that biology needs physics is because of the primacy of abstraction, idealization, and simplification. And I want to say, you know, I, I mean, unfortunately, a lot of times when you hear me, my, my titles of slides or whatever, I'm dueling with people that have made comments to me that I've thought about. I don't think I'm being defensive. I just don't agree with them. And, you know, if I'm being aggressive, I'd say sometimes I think they literally don't know what they're talking about. So here, this is rigorous and exact. This is several examples of allosteric molecules where one can rigorously demonstrate in, in both of the cases, um, all three cases, what I'm showing you is that I can quote unquote integrate out either the blue molecule or the yellow molecule. I can make no, literally no reference to it. I can pretend it does not exist when I do the mathematics, when I write down the, the, the probabilities of different states. I can integrate it out of the problem. In the same way that Gibbs, you know, when he wrote The Chemical Potential, he was telling us, you do not have to account for the molecules in the ocean if it's your reservoir. You can ignore them. You can treat them exactly in the form of the chemical potential, and that will suffice. You do not need to handle the reservoir. And that's, you know, I think that's really profound. So, you know, in physics, we have these theories about what are called ignorable coordinates. If you want to see the simplest example of it, consider two masses connected by a string, a spring between them, and each of them attached to a wall, a spring by a spring to a wall. That thing has two modes of vibration, this one and this one. If I choose to write in terms of the Cartesian coordinates of the two particles by themselves, it's a lousy coordinate system. If I choose to write it in terms of those symmetric and anti-symmetric linear combinations, the problem decouples. I found the right coordinate system. And you know, there's this, even this notion of what are called irrelevant operators, where we actually formally show that something doesn't matter. So my claim is that this is something beautiful and wonderful that physics offers biology that's not, it's zero parts in the biology curriculum. This notion of explicitly seeking out, intentionally trying to get rid of degrees of freedom. Again, it's not just some made up thing. So that's profound. Uh, I already talked about this, so I'll skip it. And you know, to my mind, one of the beauties of what physics has to offer biology is that it tells us when things that were ostensibly different are the same. So here, you know, I'm taking one of my favorite examples, which is Alistair. I think I already mentioned, I, I gave a whole vignette about a certain biologist who I adore and admire, saying he wouldn't even bother talking to physics types that were switching to biology unless they could define Alistair. And here I'm giving you three distinct examples of allosteric molecules, chemotaxis receptors, quorum sensing receptors, and the lac repressor. And what I'm saying is, you know, these are all the same. One equation that rules them all is the way that I would put it. And they make, you, you can compute once and for all for this model what the leakiness is, what the dynamic range is, what the midpoint is, what the slope at the midpoint, which is cooperativity. I can compute that ir basically without thinking about what particular case study I'm thinking of, and when I look at a ligand gated ion channel and a transcription factor, it's the same equation. And so in that sense, it's the same, in the same way that it's the same green function for diffusion from a point source or the motion of a polymer. I mean, I can't help it. That's the way the world turned out to be. And it's an amazing gift that things are the same. So I also wanted to say, you know, the kind of thing that physics offers is demonstrated by this really, really interesting, you know, pretty harsh article by Marcus Meister uh, at Caltech. You know, I'm a big fan of his. He's a, he's a rough guy. He's a deep thinker. And he wrote this article on physical limits to magnetogenetics in which he essentially challenged the interpretation of some experimental results. And the thing I want to say is that this remains to some extent controversial. I do not believe all the key players are satisfied that they've come to a common understanding. But what Marcus had to say was there are certain laws of physics and it doesn't matter what your story is. You, you obey the laws of physics, period. And if you don't, then it's on you, meaning the person that's not obeying the laws of physics to explain why not, not the other way around. The laws of physics trump the data. That's, that's in a way what the argument would be. So, you know, I'm not gonna go into the details other than to say 
that many times in this course, we did things like equation six. We compared two energies. The numerator was usually some deterministic energy of interest. The denominator was KT. And we asked the question, what's that ratio like? And if the ratio is really, really small, uh, then that means that the thermal energy is going to dominate. And, you know, Marcus does this same trick several times. You can see it again at the bottom of this page. And, you know, he's saying, well, look, the thermal energy scale is over yonder on the right-hand side here where it says thermal energy per degree of freedom. And then he's saying for these three case studies that people did, that the energy scale is way below the thermal energy. And that poses a problem. And, you know, this, this went back and forth. There's a... Uh, there's a whole way in which on eLife, you know, this debate can be operative. And, you know, <laughs> I'm going to read this last paragraph. In his paper, Meister incorrectly states our collective view on the operative mechanism. Nope, he doesn't. He's just telling you that there's a scale. That's not a statement about mechanism per se. While we're considering several hypotheses, we agree that the precise mechanism is undetermined. Lastly, although mathematical calculations can often be used to model biologic phenomena when enough of the relevant attributes of the system are known, the intrinsic complexity of biologic processes can in other instances limit the applicability of purely theoretical calculations. It is our view that mathematical theory needs to accommodate the available data, not the other way around. And there you go. We are, oh, we are thus surprised that Meister would stridently question the validity of an extensive data set published by two independent groups without performing any experiments. Well, you know what? Here we are. You know, like... I'm in Marcus's camp on this one. And, you know, these are extremely distinguished scientists. And harsh, vicious disagreement, I would say. And at the end of the day, I don't agree with the philosophy espoused by Friedman here. And all I really mean by that is, he, he, good for him, I totally agree. You know, like, were the experiments done carefully? I think he's saying they think they did the experiments carefully. Good. I, I'm willing to accept that. But to renounce saying KBT physics is not, you, not, it's not even part of this discussion, no, I, I, don't, I don't think that's correct. As, and I'm saying that not as, I'm not a part player in this. What I am is somebody who teaches freshman biology and writes books. And what I'm saying is that for me, when I write a book, I am not satisfied that these people, meaning all of them, Marcus included, have settled this debate. So, um, so on the subject of why biology needs physics. I still, you know, ultimately, I don't know, maybe these kinds of statements are silly, but I still kind of feel like biology is offering a bigger gift to physics than the other way around. And the reason I say that is maybe because I feel like the fundamental principles of physics have broader reach in terms of our understanding of this entire universe. And I think that our understanding of the entire universe will be improved by what we learn from biology. So, there's this great article, Molecular Vitalism, by Kirshner, Gerhardt, and Nicheson. And, you know, I, I'm really moved by this quote that I've highlighted. At the close of the 20th century, genetics reigns triumphant as the central theme in biological thought. The sequence of the human genome is widely seen as the starting point for biological investigation in the next century. And the debate on the origin of life largely defines alive as equivalent to accurately tr transmitting a genetic blueprint. We do not question the importance of genetics, nor dispute the role of DNA as the blueprint for all the components of living systems. But we think it worth asking to what extent the post-genomic view of modern biology would convince a 19th century vitalist that the nature of life was now understood. And you know, that's in a way another statement about, you know, they say the physical, chemi physical chemical nature of living systems. And that's in a way what I'm talking about. You know, physics helps us understand the physical chemical nature of living systems. I showed this earlier. We're going to look at it again. This is why biology needs physics. Or why we all need each other. Tomorrow I'm getting on an airplane. March 14th today. I'm going somewhere where I will be in the water seeing this. And every time I, I do, I just... I'm mesmerized and also clear on the fact that we are not on top of this. So, uh, you know, I said this earlier, but, um, you know, Heinrich Hertz worked out the theory of elastic deformations due to a contact. In the top, you see, uh, top left, you see a sphere impacting a planar surface. You can use elasticity theory. On the right, I show you, you know, a version of the green function, the elastic deformations that surround such a, an indenter. 
but that does not help us understand this problem. And, you know, the, uh, to me, this is just not a words phenomenon. It's, uh, it's crying out for mathematics. So the status, why biology needs physics, is because of this comment from Bill Bialik. We're trying to understand how the same forces that usually cause carbon-based materials to look like rocks or, or sludge can, under some conditions, cause some of this material to organize itself and walk or swim or fly out of the laboratory. What is special about the state of matter that we call life? How does it come to be this way? Different generations of physicists have approached these mysteries in different ways. So, you know, I just, uh, I'm not going to say who, I'm not going to say where, but I was just with somebody that's hyper famous in the world of science last week, and this person and I had a big debate in front of a bunch of other people about the status of laws in biology. And if I were to characterize it in some sense, I would just say that there's this defeatism that, you know, biology is too complicated, biology is the product of evolution, there's too many parts, you know, et cetera. There's just all these reasons why we will, will not and cannot understand biology in the same way we understand physics. And, you know, my answer to that was, look, there was a hundred year period after Newton, the 1700s, when D'Alembert, Clairaut, um, Euler, Lagrange, Laplace were all engaged in trying to figure out does the inverse law, square law for gravitation really, really hold? And, you know, there's a, there's a long line from Galileo and his measurement of the bending of a beam to designing a 777 on a computer. It's, a, you know, hundreds of years. So, you know, I think the long view tells me that we're just... Uh, we're just babes, you know, we're at our infancy in trying to understand life from the point of view of physical principles. And I, I think it's very important to say, you know, when I say those words, I'm explicitly meaning that I'm expecting that this is not an atom by atom or not a molecule by molecule or residue by residue understanding. Lots of times I'm expecting that it will not feature those degrees of freedom. That's the whole point. That's what physics brings to the table. So, you know, Phil Nelson, Bill Bialik, Ray Goldstein, you know, three of my heroes, three of the people that I feel so, <laughs> so fortunate to have known in this career. I'm pro I probably feel way more fortunate to have known them than the other way around. Um, but, you know, these, these are people that are thinking extremely deeply about a principled approach. And, you know, like if, if the two books are too long, then, you know, take a look at Ray's quite profound article, Our Theoretical Results Results. You know, it's got the best abstract ever, yes. So I think that's the, the main things that I wanted to say about why biology needs physics, why physics needs biology, why I need them both, you know, to, to just summarize on that last point, why I need them both. Because they render life more beautiful. They render my life more beautiful. They re render the phenomena of the world more beautiful. They try, they allow us to penetrate the mystery of the world around us, and that's a, that's a wonderful thing.